Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Scottsdale meeting. Um, my name is Maria F, and I'm a recovered compulsive overeater. I'm from County Dublin in Ireland. Just to let you know, if some of you have joined us and you don't already know, Harlan had a fall the other day um, in Chicago, so he's currently in hospital, so he won't be joining us this evening. Um, he's doing well, he's doing really well. We've been in contact with him, and he's hoping to leave hospital tomorrow so just if you are listening in Harlan we're sending you all our love and all our best wishes if you have joined us um, and, and Maria Maria let me interrupt you to say he's in the hospital in Scottsdale Arizona thanks Nancy yes thank you and we've got two speakers today Lindsay W and RAB they are going to share for 30 minutes each then we will have Q&A which will be hosted by Nancy J in Geneva we ask today that if you keep your microphones on mute at all times during today's Speak to while the two speakers are speaking. And also, if you need to step away from your camera for any reason at all, can you please just disconnect your screen because it could be distracting for other people. We'll post a link of the previous week's recordings in the chat and also a link to the self-tradition payment. We'll do that in the chat. We'll stay on afterwards in the parking lot for about 15 or 20 minutes. So if anybody at the end is looking for a sponsor or indeed if you are available to sponsor, please do hang back with us. So now we are going to go over to who wants to share first, guys, and how you like your time. Who wants to go first? Thanks, Maria. I'm going to go first. And okay. I would love um, after 10 minutes, after 20 minutes, and then a two minute warning. So at 10 minutes, at 18 minutes, and then a two minute warning. Yep. Because um, we get what? We get 30 minutes? 30 minutes. Okay. So I want 10 minutes, 20 minutes, and then a two minute. Yes please. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Here you go, Lindsay. All right, you're ready for me. Okay. All right. Hi, I am Lindsay, and I am a compulsive overeater. Um, thank you so much for asking me to share this afternoon. It's now afternoon here in Texas by three minutes. Um, you know, it's interesting because, um, Recently, when I've been asked to share, it's like when I'm in the middle of, um, you know, something really intense or something really painful going on in my life. And my immediate response or my immediate reaction when I'm asked to share is like, no, I, I, I can't do that right now. You know, I've got a lot going on. I'm in a lot of pain. You know, I'm just trying to get through one day at a time, like no way, Jose, I'm not going to share. And, um, that was really my reaction, you know, when, when Nancy asked me and then I thought, wait a second, you know, it's that, it's that pause now and that moment of like, oh yeah, this is, this is what we do, right? Like this is, this is what we do to, um, this is how I get out of myself. And this is the solution. I mean, I'm, you know, right now in this moment, I am, I'm living in my solution, which is to, um, carry the message to help others, to think of someone other than myself for this, hopefully 90 minutes. I can, I can think of somebody other than myself. And, um, so anyway, I'm really, I'm really grateful. I'm really grateful to, to be here this morning. And, um, I, so at the end of this month, gosh, it's already mid September. So in a couple of weeks, I will have two and a half years of food sobriety. Um, I am down 200 pounds as a result of working the, the 12 steps I'm going to share my photos just so that you all can see, um, what, what the disease, how the disease manifested for me physically. Um, let's see here. <clears throat> okay. So as you can see in, in the disease at the height of my disease, you know, um, it, it manifested as morbid obesity. So I got up to 350 pounds at five foot three. And, you know, I look at these pictures and I think, gosh, you know, I was still really trying to be stylish. I've got my little fur on at my work event and, you know, I'm at the rodeo, like sporting my denim jacket. I'm trying, but there's no light behind my eyes. Um, you know, there's really not. And I look at these photos and I just feel a lot of different feelings. You know, I feel a lot of sadness 
And um, I also feel a whole lot of compassion. I feel a whole lot of compassion for um, for this girl, you know, who was doing the best she could um, going through going through life. And uh, but it was it was really painful. It was really challenging. Um, here are just a few other photos, you know, that show the physical manifestation of the disease. You know, I wasn't. I mean, I wasn't living. You know, I wasn't even able to walk from my apartment to my, to my car and my parking garage, you know, I just, I, um, my life had gotten really small and, um, yeah, it was, I was living just to eat. And, um, now, you know, these are some of my, um, current photos. Well, these aren't actually current. These are kind of on the way down, but last year I turned 40. That's me and my sister, um, I took a trip with friends this year to Nashville. That was really fun. You know, um, what these photos show even more than the weight loss is just that I'm, I'm existing in the stream of life now, right? Like this photo here on the left, um, I'm with my niece and my nephews at Disney world in, in February. And I could have never gone to Disney world before. I mean, there's so much walking there and I was riding all the roller coasters without even thinking about it. Right. Like those are the gifts of this program. And for somebody who, and I'll share more about what it was like, but for somebody who couldn't even get a half day out of the food, half a day out of the food, you know, I mean, to be able to be living in life and doing these things, you know, I'm a huge football fan. And so I took my nephews and my dad and brother-in-law to um, an NFL game last December. And, you know, I remember the last time I had gone to one and it was horribly painful and I was squished into the seats. And um, here's an, actually an example of that. So I have a couple of these before and after photos. So as I mentioned, huge sports fan. On the far left, I'm at the World Series game for my Houston Astros. We had great tickets. We're there on the first baseline. Like it was an experience of a lifetime. And all I can tell you is that I wanted to just disappear. I wanted to leave. I was so uncomfortable. All I could think about was how I was making everyone else uncomfortable, how everyone else must want me to leave because I was taking up so much space. And the guy, like there was another guy sitting next to me that's not even in this photo. So it was just horribly uncomfortable. And then here on um, on the right of it, you know, is last Memorial Day weekend. I went to Los Angeles, where, by the way, I've met some of my best friends in this program and went to an Angels game. And we had a great time and I fit in the seat and, you know, I'm just participating in life now. And it's such, oh my gosh, such a miracle, such a gift of this program, something I never ever thought would be possible for someone like me. And then this is just like two of my work headshots side by side that I include. And then this is just another, like, this is an event I attend every year. And it just kind of shows a progression of, of my, my physical, um, my physical sort of manifestation at, at this event. So, um, yeah, just to show those photos and look, I mean, you know, my sponsor always says, you know, when we show our photos, um, it makes people lean in, right. And say, oh, wow. Like, oh, so, so you, you, you do have what I have and you got better. And, and I really, I want to listen. I want to listen even more closely. And that's how it was for me, right? Like the sponsors that I've worked with, you know, they too were three, 400 pounders. And then I saw that they, you know, that they had all of this recovery, including the physical recovery. And it was like, oh, wow. Like, like, let me listen because it looks like you actually have a life now. And I would really like that. So, um, I'll share a little bit more about, about what it was like. Um, you know, I mean, look, my whole life, I went to food for comfort. I mean, I remember that as a little kid, you know, sneak in, Lindsay. say, say one more time, 10. Ten minutes in. Oh, thank you so much. Okay, great. Bye. Um, and so I remember, you know, um, as a kid, just always, you know, sneaking the food and things like that, you know, it was like, I mean, as a young girl, it was what I used for comfort. And then, um, you know, when I went to college is when things, things got really bad. And there are a few experiences I had there that I just like to share because they, they, they were, um, just really critical moments in me in just in this experience for me. So, so one is that, um, when I went to college, 
you know, I, I, I always, I never really felt part of a group, you know, like either, either, um, you were too cool for me and I wasn't going to be able to like be part of your group or, um, you weren't, you weren't cool enough. Right. And so I was always like trying to find where I fit in and, and this disease is a disease of isolation. I still experience it to the day. It's always showing me how I'm different from you, how you're better than me, or I'm better than you. Like it's so, it's so challenging just to be on the same level, right? Here we are on the same level. So in college, I was isolating so much and I didn't want to, you know, I, 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 I was terrified to try to be part of the group. So I used food to stuff down all of that loneliness. And, um, you know, I started doing the thing where I'd go to multiple fast food restaurants and order, you know, food for a family of six and pretend I'm on the phone with somebody, you know, while I'm ordering multiple drinks, things like that. Right. And, um, So I went home one weekend to visit my parents and, you know, we put together this budget because I was spending all this money on fast food. And they said, Hey, when you get back, just go to the grocery store, get your food, go to the cafeteria, do the meal plan, all of that. Right. And I thought, yeah, of course. And I, you know, it's, um, I always go back to the part in Bill's story where he says this time I meant business. Right. And that's, that's me too. Right. I meant business. I agreed with my parents. Yeah. I'm going to go back. I'm going to go to the grocery store. And I just remember I was driving back into the city where I went to college and, um, you know, I just had this conversation with my parents and it was like, the steering wheel turned against my will into the fast food restaurant. And I didn't have the, the, the verbiage for it. I didn't have the words for it at the time, but I just remember thinking, Oh, something is really wrong with me. Like I'm really in trouble here because I don't want to do this. I see how this is hurting me. I see how this is damaging me and I can't stop. And that was really, really scary. And I mean, I think I was at age 19 or 20 then. So, right, it's going to take me nearly two more decades of being in pain and being in that like remorse, horror, and absolute hopelessness of the disease to, you know, walk into the rooms of Overeaters Anonymous and work the, you know, put the food down and work the steps. So that was just a really terrifying moment. Um, I, um, you know, in this disease, I've been, I've been married, I've been divorced, I've moved across the country, I've moved back, like I've tried a lot of ways to get better. Um, You know, I've spent tons of money on on food, food delivery was my big thing, right? So I would, um, like every day, I would be ordering hundreds of dollars worth of food, and I couldn't even afford it. I would just get the insufficient funds fees in my checking account. And then it was probably, I don't know, six or maybe five, four or five years ago, I had an eviction notice on my door. So I was in my mid thirties. I had a good career. I was making decent money and I was getting kicked out of my apartment. So when I say, you know, that I am a gutter level, like heroin addict with the food, I really mean it. Like this disease took me to really deep, dark places. Um, and you know, I, um, yeah, I mean the fact that I'm the fact I wasn't supposed to be here today. I'm not supposed to be the girl that's talking on this meeting. Are you kidding me? I mean, I will tell you how many years did I listen to Harlan G's podcast while I was binging? while I was driving through fast food restaurants, while I was just sitting on my couch with the blinds drawn, canceled all my plans for the weekend, you know, ordering the next pizza delivery. How many times did I listen to him and all, you know, many others of you that had recovery? Like the fact that I am speaking today with almost two and a half years of recovery and that I can actually show up and talk about this, like, I thought I, that none of you could possibly understand what was wrong with me because it was so bad. There's no way you had what I had because you wouldn't have gotten better. I was completely hopeless. So for those of you, I know there are 136 others on here right now. You know, for those of you that are here right now, if you're binging, if you believe that there's no possible way that you could get what I've got 
that you can have what I have, that you can have the recovery that you hear people talk about. Like, I get it. I was there. I was at that level of complete hopelessness and despair. I wanted to kill myself. I um, went and spent the night at a friend's house one night because I didn't feel safe being in my own apartment. There was a night where I woke up in the middle of the night and um, I was just like, I don't want to be alive anymore. I really don't. I don't even want to be here anymore. I can't get this. I can't stop eating. The food makes me want to die. Not eating the food makes me want to die. I couldn't even do it for half a day. And I just remember I like touched my cat who was sleeping in my bed with me. And it was like her purr was like a higher power, right? I mean, it was just like, okay, there's another being in this room that's alive with me right now. And it was like my cat's purr kept me safe from myself that night. I mean, you know, I've, this disease really took me to some, some dark places and, um, and, you know, I mean, look and all the physical stuff too. I mean, you know, flying in airplanes, you know, I couldn't, I mean, I, I could barely fly in an airplane. Obviously I had to have the seatbelt extender. I mean, I, you know, went on a reward trip for my, um, for my company and they did this beautiful farewell dinner for us on the beach in Jamaica. And I walk out there and I see the chairs that they have, right? And they're these little flimsy chairs in the sand. So I had to leave, you know, I had to fake sick and walk away and leave this, this reward dinner. I mean, it's just stuff like that, where it's like my life was constant anxiety, fear, hopelessness. I just wanted to die. So then I want to talk about what happened. Um, so it was a, about almost three and a half years ago, we were freshly into quarantine and, um, you know, I had, so backing up just a tiny bit, I had been to my first Overeaters Anonymous meeting when I was in my twenties and now I'm, I'm 41. So it had been o- over 10 years since I'd been to my first OA meeting. And I had no idea what you people were talking about. I mean, the, the spiritual solution went completely over my head, right? I mean, for me, it was just like a free Weight Watchers or something like that. And, um, it was like, I knew it was like, I had this knowings ever since that moment that my solution was in the rooms of 12 step. And that was, and now I know it was higher power that planted that seed, but I had no idea how I was going to get back. Um, and so, you know, look, I just started calling back into meetings, just started calling. And like, I just told you, like I would be, I remember fast food restaurants that I would be driving through when I would be on certain meetings, but I was there was calling in, had a really big problem with step two, came to believe that a power greater than me could restore me to sanity. No, thanks. I have no interest in God. The God of my childhood, I thought screwed me over. And especially the people that followed the God of my childhood, I wanted nothing to do with anyone who wanted anything to do with God. So I just kept calling in though and binging. Well, okay. So a little over three years ago, just in a quarantine, um, it was a Sunday afternoon. And I thought to myself, you know, I should probably weigh myself just to see like where things are. And, um, I hadn't weighed in a long time. I'm five foot three and I weighed in at 350 pounds. And it was almost like I blacked out in that moment. In fact, I actually had to go back in my phone and look at, um, a text I had sent a friend with the weight because I really did. I just, it was like, I blacked out. I couldn't even remember what it was. And, um, you know, in that moment, I thought, okay, you know, I think my life is really over. Like I'm going to end up on that show, my 600 pound life. Um, cause I mean, it was just, I mean, I was gaining, 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 and I couldn't stop it. I couldn't stop. Right. And that is, and as it says in the big book, like that's the baffling, terrifying feature of this illness, the utter inability to, to leave it alone, no matter how great the necessity or the wish couldn't stop. I wanted to, I needed to, and I couldn't do it. And that's, that's really scary when you think about it. I mean, if I don't feel completely and totally screwed in step one, then like, I don't, I'm not sure I really have this disease and I'm not sure I've really taken step one. Because if I'm, if I really admit I'm powerless and my life is unmanageable, then I am screwed. I, I got nothing. And so, um, <clears throat> that day I weighed in at 350 and my only solution to the despair and hopelessness and terror 
that I felt in that moment was to binge. I didn't know what else to do, right? I had no other way to escape the pain of that moment. And that was one of the most painful moments of my life. Like that realization that things were really like done for me. Um, and I binged, I remember I ordered Italian food for a family of six. And when I say I ordered food for a family of six or more, like I am not exaggerating. I ate a lot of food and, um, I did, I binged that day and, um, and you know, in the big book, how it says like, you know, it's like the man who has a headache and beats himself on the head with a hammer. So he won't feel the ache. And that was really what it was. Right. Like, thank you, uh, and Lindsay. How much 20 you said? Thank you so much. Um, and so I, um, you know, I was, I was at a place physically where I couldn't take care of myself. Um, you know, I could barely shower, could hardly dry off, couldn't wipe myself properly. I mean, I was, you know, I was in a really, things were really, really bad physically. I mean, I was, I was essentially a handicapped individual living in the world. And, um, there was a moment where, you know, something in that area happened. And, and I had this, this moment of willingness and, and my experience of willingness is that it is a hundred percent divine intervention. There's nothing that I did to produce the willingness to finally be ready to put the food down and work the steps. And when I say put the food down and work the steps, it sounds so pretty, right? Like when people would say that I got the gift of desperation and I put the food down and work the steps and I'd be like, oh my God, that sounds so sexy. I can't wait for that to happen to me. But it was the most horrible, like painful, like climbing the walls. I want out of this situation experience I've ever had. Like the gift of desperation is painful and it's really ugly. And then those first few days of abstinence, when I called someone and said, like, I need help. And I really like, I'm willing this time. And I didn't know if I was, because I had said that probably 25 times before. And I had ghosted sponsors. I mean, I'm telling you, I was, I was bottom of the barrel y'all, you know, like I ghosted sponsors. I wouldn't even tell you, I wasn't going to call you. And this time, you know, when I did that, those first few days and weeks of, of sobriety with the food was hard. I remember making these outreach calls in tears, like leaving messages on people's voicemail, like crying. I probably, they probably had no idea what I was saying, but I was like, I don't know how I can make it through the next 30 minutes of my life without donuts. I'm out driving around and I'm going to drive through McDonald's. I mean, I got to do it. I don't think I can survive the next hour of my life without that. Um, and you know, by the grace of God, literally by the grace of God, I got through those first days and weeks of, of abstinence and worked the steps quickly. And then I became recovered. This is a, this is a really big part of my story because I was so excited to become recovered. I thought there was this finish line, right? I thought like, as soon as I got through the 12th step, I was going to hit the finish line. I was going to be one of the recovered people. And like, I had this vision. I'm very visual. So it was like, there was like this shore of recovered people who had like, you know, parties, right? Like, oh, we're the recovered people. We're having the parties. And then all of the people who were still struggling, like I was forever, they're like in the ocean and, you know, we go out and help them, of course, but like, we're the recovered people on the shore. I mean, I have this whole idea of what life was going to be like, how I was supposed to act. I was supposed to talk a certain way. I wasn't supposed to have certain struggles. You know, like I was, I, I needed you to see me in a certain way because I was recovered. And like, I don't know that I really even have to tell you this part, but I relapsed because, you know, dishonesty for me, if I'm not going to talk about what's really going on with me, it leads directly to a relapse. So, um, I <clears throat> wasn't honest about the relapse for a while. You know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to tell anybody that I had relapsed. And then finally I did. And I started working with a new sponsor and, um, 
you know, what he told me was all you have to do is pick up the phone and say, I want to eat and I need help. Right. Whenever I first started working the steps. So that's what I did. All right. Picked up the phone. It was really hard. I was like, do you want me to be calling you all day, every day? Because that's how I felt, you know, like if I need to be saying, I want to eat and I need help. Well, that's all day long. But, but, but in the very beginning, I was asked, okay, what's your prayer? What's your prayer? Right. Like, how do I take this to God? And, um, I want to eat. Okay. One of my favorite prayers is God, please help me just seek and find in you what I'm looking for in the food. And by the way, in the beginning, and sometimes even now I have no idea what I'm praying to. I don't know what's happening. I don't know how it works or why it works, but what I do know is that it does work. And, um, I was also taught this analogy, which is, this is in the beginning when I was just trying to like, you know, sort of figure out what is my conception of God. And I was given this analogy of like, you know, those charging pads and you put your phone on the charging pad and you leave it there for half an hour, a couple of hours, you come back, here's my phone, pick up the phone. It's fully charged. Well, I don't know how that happened. I don't know how that works, but I have faith that it did. My phone is charged and I'm going to go on through the entire day with the belief that my phone is charged. I'm using it like it's charged. Things are happening. And so that was how I went about my prayer and meditation. Like I showed up, I sat on the charging pad. Sometimes I even think of the chair I sit in as a charging pad. I don't know what's happening, right? I don't know what higher power is. My conception of God is so big and so undefined. And so I just show up and I just do the prayer and the meditation. I go about the day as though something happened, right? As though my phone is charged and I just have that faith. And another one of my favorite prayers is just God, please increase my faith and trust that I'm going to be taken care of. Um, just these really short, simple prayers that become my mantras. And, you know, as I continue to work the steps as outlined in the big book, that is how I was sponsored. That is how I sponsor, you know, I, I continued to have a deeper connection with this power that's greater than me. And, um, you know, and honesty is a really big part of this recovery for me. So I tell on myself, I talk about what's going on. You know, if I'm, you know, I mean, I, 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 I say the ugly things I tell someone if, if I'm having a thought about food, you know, oh man, something's really going on. And the food kind of sounded good today. Well, I don't want to tell that to anybody, but if I don't, it's going to continue building and building. And, um, or if I don't tell on myself, if I don't tell a secret that I have, if I don't tell in a way that I'm being selfish, resentful, whatever that is, it's going to lead back to the food. And the truth of the matter is no matter what any of the 145 people on this zoom, think of me or on the recording, think of me today. Like if I go to bed tonight and I'm sober, then like I win today. So like I can share my dirty stuff because I just want to sober with you. Say Two it again. Minutes. Sorry to Two interrupt you. Perfect. Two Thank you. Two minutes. And so, you know, um, I think that what I what I really want to share in the last two minutes is, you know, what is it like now? And um so I had this idea that life was going to be all sunshine and roses and recovery, um, that, you know, I was going to get recovery and man, it was going to be great. And, um, you know, I was going to get to show up and speak and be all excited and raw, raw recovery. And, um, you know, look, I mean, I am like that because I do, because I do have a beautiful life today and like life is really hard you know, life can be really hard. And this summer has been really challenging for me. Um, I haven't actually shared this publicly, but it's on my heart. So I found out, um, this summer that I was expecting a child and, you know, I'm 41 years old, you know, I was 350 pounds for a long time. I thought I was going to end up single without a family. I thought my window to have kids was over and I was so excited, um, to be expecting a child. And, um, you know, I have a wonderful partner. And then the next week I found out I lost my job and, uh, that was really tough. And then, um, you know, and, and, and I really had to lean into God and my faith. And then about two weeks ago, I found out that, um, that I lost the, the baby and, um, it's been really, really hard. 
You know, it's been really hard. One of the hardest experiences I've ever gone through. And the reason I'm sharing it is because this is like, this is what recovery is about. Like the food is not going to solve my problems, right? So in those moments where I'm like, God, where are you? And why did you take this from me? I don't understand it. And in those moments where I don't want to show up for my prayer and meditation, and when I don't want to do the deal, I realize if I don't have my sobriety, if I don't have my recovery, I lose everything. And so I just have to keep showing up one day at a time and doing these actions, connecting with my higher power, meditation, prayer, helping others. You know, I've been, I continued to work with my sponsees through this staying connected to others has been challenging. I'm working on that. Cause like I said, I do want to isolate, especially when things get hard, but like, you know, I just want to share that the gift of this program is that I get this big, beautiful life. By the way, I'm in a home that I own after I had an eviction notice on my door, right? I have a wonderful partner. I'm learning how to be in a romantic relationship as a sober person. Um, I'm in this, you know, I'm in this, this healthy body. Life is big, beautiful, wonderful. And I have to feel it all. I get to feel it all. So I feel all the great things and I feel the sadness, the, the anger, sometimes the loneliness and all of the pain. And the miracle is that I don't have to use food. So for somebody that couldn't get through half a day without binging my brains out, hundreds of dollars, 350 pounds, wanting to kill myself, to be able to go through these painful life circumstances and to be able to feel it all and not use food, like God makes the impossible possible. And, um, you know, I think that's the message. A fellow gave that to me before I spoke a couple of weeks ago. God makes the impossible possible possible. And if there were ever an impossible case, you're looking at it. You're looking at it. So if you feel like you're impossible, call me. I want to talk to you, right? I want to share and just keep coming back. Um, and that's, I'm sure I'm out of time. So thank you very much. Gosh, thank you so, so much, Lindsay. That was absolutely powerful. Um, I'm very sorry for your loss. Just want to share that with you. I didn't want to interrupt you because the truth is I didn't want you to stop speaking. I just wanted to hear more and more. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for being with us. And now we're going, I guess you're in the same place. So we're going to go switch over to Ori. Hey, Ori. Hello, hello. How are you doing? Can I be heard? You can be heard well. Man, uh, I mean, we can stop this right now and just go to questions. That was a great talk. <laughs> Um, my name is Ori. I'm a compulsive overeater. Just before you start, Ori, how would you like your time? Um, let's let's see if I can make it to 20 minutes, and sure. then um, 10. You get 10 minutes after that. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. always struggle with the long format shares. Um, so I'll try to I'll try to share some experience, strength, and hope. And uh, if I have the fuel. To go the full 30 minutes, I will, um, or I'll just stop and open it up early for sharing. Um, um, I used to be, um, well, I'm uh, seven, just over seven years um, on July 14th. Um, I celebrated seven years. Um, so I'm seven years and some months um, of food sobriety. And, um, uh, I used to be a 485 pound man. Um, I apologize for not having my pictures, but I'm on a, I'm not on my computer right now. Um, I can share those later, um, if we can get that set up, but, uh, yeah, I used to be 485 pounds and I've lost, uh, or I've been relieved. I've been relieved of over 240 pounds. Um, And a miracle of healing is definitely, yeah, it's just like, I'm going to, you know, I'm just one example of the miracle of healing that can happen here. Um,
I um I don't know. I was just I was just hit with a wave of sadness right now. Honestly. I was hit with a wave of sadness and um Yeah, um I used to I I have like I'm going through this phase where I have remorse for the the um like the loss of the recovery I once or the, the perspective I had once in recovery. Um I I used to feel like I had something to say. Um, I felt like, or I had the belief that I had words of wisdom to share with you all. And maybe, 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 uh, you know, in a sense I had it, like I, I, I had it, I had it locked. Like I had, I, I just felt confident in my shares in, um, yeah, I just, I guess I felt like somebody, um, and it started like at the end of year six and so, like, now I just feel like, I just feel so not confident. Um, several, you know, just about a month ago, maybe a month or two ago, um, It just felt like life wasn't going my way, you know, like my way and things were being taken away. And it was just like every day was like F or a day, like, you know, like life is laughing at me. You make plans. It doesn't it doesn't matter, you know. And uh, then I experienced a great loss. Um and that leveled me too. And I, st I feel like this is the worst year of my life right now. <laughs> um, I know that this is more than an intellectual exercise. And, you know, all the mental devices that I had that I relied upon to provide me emotional security disappeared. And there are some very real moments where I have to go back to this, this, this prayer that it's like, God, you have to be real in this moment because my intellect, my mind, has reached this limit. My ideas are failing me. My thoughts about myself, my thoughts about others, my thoughts about what I need for emotional security, my thoughts about how I interact with others, my thoughts about life are failing me completely. And this is this is in recovery still, right? Like there are still ideas that I have, I have, you know, methods that I get through life and I try to find this emotional security, this, this, this contentment that fail utterly. And it produces an, a state of fear. And in those moments, the only thing that I can rely upon is power, spiritual power. And, you know, God doesn't talk to me directly. Like, you know, it's like, I don't get a, um, I don't, I don't have a direct line to higher power where it's just like, you know, I hear, I hear the voice of God and I get clear direction and I know I'm absolutely right in the actions that I'm taking. I don't get it that way. You know, it comes, it, the, the, the power shows up in so many different ways. Inspiration comes in so many different ways. Sometimes in my meditation, 
in my prayer and meditation, I'll get a thought that I had like a, a, you know, a view that I had never considered. Sometimes it comes through re reliance upon my brotherhood, my, my, my community of men that I'm connected to and that, you know, in, in talking to them or in working with somebody else, the inspiration to come, or maybe it comes in, you know, reading the big book and some line jumps out at me that I've read a thousand times. And sometimes somehow it seems new, like this inspiration comes in different times, different ways, you know? And uh, it's not it's not a cookie cutter formula. And that faith has to be real. That faith has to be real. Like God has to be real. Like it has to be this, the most the central important fact of my life is God has to be real. And this is a different way of living, right? You know, when I was 400 and and look, when I was 485 pounds, like that's, that's my default, right? Like that, like I can go into the food law, right? Of being 485 pounds. It's a powerful existence. I mean, I'm sorry. It's a painful existence. It's nothing sexy about being 485 pounds. Like you can, I'm sure you can imagine you've heard the stories. I'm sure you can imagine the pain of, but, but, you know, what, what it, what it comes down to me, it, it's like, that is the best idea I have in how to get through life. Like, really, like, you know, I have so much compassion and just so much sadness around that. Like that was the best idea. I didn't have any other means of showing up and dealing with life. Like that was my, that was my solution to everything. You know, and, and this, this, this idea of like just a, a complete lack of control. I lost control. I don't even remember ever having control. As a young child, I tell this story, like it, it's some, it's a vivid memory where, you know, um, I would eat to the point where I would throw up, you know, and that was at an early age. That was my best thinking, man. That's that, that was food was excitement. Food was convivial, conviv conviviality and companionship and food was, food was everything. It gave me that life is good feeling. And I pursued that to 485 pounds. And something broke in me and I had to find another way. And this is not my first time around, but this is the first time I've had this brand of recovery. Where I'm not using food. Life happens and the food doesn't change. That's something that we say in my men's group a lot. Life happens and the food doesn't change. Of course, you know, I have the dietitian and I have the guidance on, you know, what I should eat and what I shouldn't eat. I have the the food sobriety and I'm clear on alcoholic foods, you know, and it's like that's very important, right? That's very important having clarity around that and not 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 using food um in an addictive way is very is you know, that's absolutely important, but that like that's that's just the entry ticket to what what really needs to happen here. And I need a transformation that's beyond my capability. I need a complete and utter change in how I experience life. And that's happened, like that's happened over time. You know, it's like the um the 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 slow drip method. And you know. The more I grow, the more experiences that I'm privy to the more opportunities for defects of character to come up, the more opportunities to do the spiritual work, the more growth happens. And it, it just, you know, this recovery is progressive. And I'm living in a life and experiencing things that I never imagined for myself. I never imagined, you know, it took... Like, I never thought I'd be excited about being a father. 
Like I never, I, like that was not even on my rate, my resume of things that I, that I, that I, that I envisioned in my life. Like I, I like, how can you, when my primary relationship is with, with the food, you know, there was a time where at 485 pounds, I didn't even think I could have a girlfriend. But let's go even further back. Like there was a time where, you know, you know, early in my recovery, like, you know, some of the fixed ideas that I had, I, I thought I was incapable of loving someone or being in an intimate relationship, exposing my body, exposing my body, having sex, all that. Like it was it was just not even on. It was a foregone conclusion that those experiences weren't even available to me. Just some of it, that I said, like, you know, and like I said, you know, finding out that I would be a father, and then, and then, and then, walking through that moment and experiencing the joy and the anticipation of it, and wanting that for myself, like, wow, like being excited, like this is the journey, and then that being taken away. You know, and then walking through incredible disappointment. And seeing life on an ultrasound and then not seeing life on an ultrasound. It was just like something kicked me, kicked me in a place that I couldn't even reach, that I even didn't even know existed. And, you know, and I'm glad I'm surrounded by people and, I, you know, I'm surrounded by men who share stories with me of the sorrow and disappointment and depression that follows as a result of losing an unborn child, I'd never heard stories like this. And this came from groups of men that I'm connected to in this program. They've walked me through so many, so many of these moments. If you think, if you think I'm doing any of this on my own, you're, it, let me just tell you now, it is not me. The only thing I do is I just continue to show up to the well and drink. And I don't want to share, I don't want to share these moments. So it, it's so much easier. It really is. It's so much easier just to, you know, well, that's a lie. In my, in my right state of mind, going back to the food is just like that. Whatever I'm, the pain I'm walking through now, it's not, it's not even an option to go back to the food. Like it's not even like that is just, that's a non-life. That's non-existence. That's non-existence. And, you know, my feet know what to do. I have my feet know what to do after, you know, it, 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 this is practice. You practice, you practice, you practice, you practice this enough. So it, I, I think I feel like it becomes a thing that's. It, it's like I know. I'll be walked through this experience. I know. However painful it is, there's something on the other side. And victory over this experience, victory in the sense of, no, I didn't get my way. Victory in the sense of this happened and I survived and I grew. In that context, my experience can be something greater than my, my desires and myself, right? Like it becomes something that people can be inspired by and they can walk through like, right. That's like, that's why I keep, keep coming back. That's why I plug in the meetings. That's why I continue to work. Cause I just want like the, the, the most powerful, look, we do all these big book studies. You know, we, we got big book analytics. We have worksheets up the Yazoo. We have our gurus in program. We have all this great stuff. We have all this, all, all this material that ap appeals to your intellect. Right. But when it comes down to it, when life slugs me in the face, 
only a spiritual power can help me experience that, put my hand in somebody else's hand, and walk through it. And when I plug into these groups, I hear incredible stories of people who have walked through unimaginable pain and stayed sober. Right? I hear people that didn't get their way and life royally gave them I don't want to cuss, but a situation, circumstances, and they walk through it. You know, I heard several, I heard uh, about a decade ago, one of uh, somebody I've known in program for a long time, she talked about um, her daughter being murdered. And she stayed sober and abstinent. And she's still around today kicking. This old gal is still around. She shared, I, I remember she shared that it had to be almost a decade ago, but that story is still something that inspires me and informs me that, yes, this can happen and you can walk through this too. I didn't have that at 485 pounds. I had these ideas that life was supposed to be, well, I had to, I, it had to go my way in order for me to feel emotionally secure and to feel fulfilled and to feel good. Like I, that's, that was the limitation of my belief. I didn't know, oh, you can lose or seemingly lose, seemingly experience pain and disaster and walk through that and triumph over that and become stronger as a result of. We're 20 minutes in, Ori. Awesome. I'm still going. I still got the juice. Good man. <laughs> I think I just want to offer hope. And Marianne M would like to control your camera. Yeah, no, I don't think so. I just want to offer hope to people. I want, you know, I, I want to show that this program thing is more than an intellectual exercise. Um, I needed every big book study I did. I needed um, every workshop. I needed every, like, every guru I talked to. I needed all those. I needed all those, right? I needed to be a part of the you know, like I, I went through a, a phase where I needed to be a part of the in crowd, the the you know, the clique that has the strong recovery. And then, you know, once I saw that those people were just people, I became disenchanted. I needed to pedestalize people. I needed to have the that rigidity in the beginning where it's like I'm doing it right and you're doing it wrong. I needed to, I needed every moment where I, I was critical of somebody share because, you know, they weren't doing it the right way. I needed all that stuff, right? It got me to where I am now. And then I had to grow out of all that. Now I'm walking through the experience where I don't know shit. <laughs> what I do know is that there's power. I don't I don't understand. I like I really don't understand how all I did was take direction. I showed up. I do the prayers. I did what my sponsor told me to do. I did what these other guys did. I did the service. I do the like I don't I really don't understand how I went for like the person that needed. I absolutely needed a whole pizza at one meal. And the, and the and and the buffalo wings and the lava cake, you know, and the and 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 the, you know, how does a person go from that to being absolutely free of the obsession and finding ways to get through life? Like I don't know. 
Like it's it, 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 to me, it's not. It's it, you know, I, there. I went through a time where I knew the formula, and then that formula blew up. And then it's like, is there a formula? No, it's not a formula. It's like then it gets to like just God, like this thing, this power, this spiritual power that somehow I tap into when I engage in spiritual actions, it works. When I see these defects of character crop up, I ask God, please, please help me change. When when that superiority cr 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 creeps in, when that critical nature creeps in, where nobody is doing anything right, where life itself isn't right, I ask God to please, please remove my criticism. Please, please allow me forgiveness. Please allow me understanding. I pray for the ability to be understanding and compassionate because I don't want to be a freaking asshole. It's painful. Help me have integrity. Help me be an example, a light on this path. Help me be something greater than myself, greater than my own thinking, because my own thinking just keeps me in bondage. If I relied upon my own thinking, it would keep me like it. If I continue to rely upon my own thinking, you know, the things that I've been able to experience in life up until this point in this recovery, I would have never achieved that on my own. Never. I don't know. I just want to communicate like this thing that we do here is beautiful. It's just so beautiful. It's real. It's so real. Like, I love that part in the big book where it says it really works. <laughs> it really does. Like, it really does. And if I can be of help to anyone, you know, that is the greatest joy of my life is being able to walk through brothers through this experience. And seeing the lights turn on for people and seeing them take up their beds and walk again. Not only seeing men drop hundreds of pounds, but being able to, you know, being, you know, men that could, couldn't could have girlfriends. Now they have girlfriends. Now they're experiencing life. Now they're, they're, they're respected in their community. Now they're uh, full participants in, you know, their family and you know, to see them recreate their lives or men that were totally disconnected from their family and they were just a physical presence, but they had nothing to offer. They actually become something different in their family. You know, I think I'm going to end it there. I think I'm ended there and yeah. uh, mm -hmm. I'll open the questions and my sweetie is going to join me back here and we're going to do continue to do the deal. So thank you for allowing me to be a, I hope I was of help. Certainly well, Ori. Um, a lot of help. And you said, you know, I have the juice and you certainly had the juice. And thanks for sharing your humility, your vulnerability and your hope. That's what that's certainly what I heard. So we're now going to go over to Nancy J in Geneva and Nancy is going to host our Q&A. But before we do that, can we just ask Mary Ann M to turn on her camera, please? Um, you can just let us know who you are, Mary Ann M, and turn on your camera. So over to Nancy J. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. You both were amazing, mm -hmm. wonderful. I can't say enough about what you've given us today. So 